Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. All right. Well, welcome in, everyone. Welcome to the Apex Hour. It's Thursday afternoon here on the campus of Southern Utah University. And as you heard, you're listening to KSUU Thunder 91.1. My name is Lynn Vartan. And today on campus, we had our annual uh, what we call live court, which is actually such a cool thing. Uh, The Utah Appeals Court holds a session on campus during our Apex events. But it gives me a chance to do something a little different for the radio show, for the Apex Hour. The judges are off doing very uh, judiciary things, and so I get to have sort of a dealer's choice here for topics. And today we are talking about books and reading. And I'm so excited to have some friends and colleagues here in the studio to talk about their relationship with books and reading and hopefully give you some inspiration for what to put um, by your bed or by the pool or wherever you choose to read. So let's start with some introductions. We'll start with ladies first, Anne. Hi. Um, thanks for inviting us, Lynn. So uh, I'm Anne Dikema. I am the department chair of the library and also an instruction librarian. Awesome. How long have you been at SEU? Since 2015. So four, over four years now. Still Super loving cool. it. All right. I know. And Anne and I have a, a little private uh, special affinity because we have this exact same glasses, which I love. <laughs> so, okay, continuing on with the introductions. Hi, um, my name is Christopher Clark, and I am the engagement and outreach librarian here at SEU. And how long have you been at SEU? So I've been at SUU um, for a while. So I started at the library in 2012, um, and I've been faculty there since uh, the beginning of 2018. Okay, cool. And tell me just a little bit about what what the term, what it means to be an outreach librarian. Uh, sure. Well, well, it's, it's pretty much what it sounds like in its yeah. most obvious sense. It's just reaching out. Um, it's a lot of event coordination, working with other departments, working with other faculty members, and, and just the community and students to try and make sure that students and, and other faculty and community members are aware that um, that the library isn't just a building, that, uh, that we're here to kind of uh, help in a variety of ways, and that in- includes with just you know, um, cluing them into cool things that are going on and, and putting on cool things and, and showing them different resources. And I think I heard, speaking of events, that there's a, an event coming right up. Maybe you could tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. So on Monday, uh, since our, our theme is talking about books today, uh, we will be putting on Booktoberfest, um, which will be in the library lobby starting at 1 p.m. Um, and we will have librarians there and bookmarks. We'll be doing some reader's advisory if you need suggestions about books. And uh, also we'll be giving away free root beer. So if you just want to like grab an A&W or whatever. Oh my um, gosh, I love it. <laughs> and tell me again the time. Uh, it'll be uh, 1 p.m. and it will go to uh, 4 p.m. And this next coming Monday, which is, I think, the The 14th. 14th. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So anybody listening live, I'm sure it's open to one, come one, come all, and check it out and get your next book suggestion and some root beer. And finishing out our introductions, let's tell everyone who you are and what you do. Hi, everyone. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for having us, Lynn. My name is Matt Nickerson. I'm the library director and associate dean of the library. And I know what you're going to ask. <laughs> and I want to say it because I'm proud. Yeah. This is my 30th year at Southern Utah University. In fact, it's my 29th year because I started at Southern Utah State College. Oh, my gosh. Well, happy anniversary. <laughs> and for those listening, Southern Utah State College was the previous name of the school. Mm-hmm. So you've seen it through. You, Absolutely. You, you know where all the secrets are. <laughs> I know a lot of them. But, of course, we started back in the previous century. So <laughs> 30 years may sound like a lot, but the university or the college has been around a lot longer than that. 
Well, welcome to all of you. Um, I love to read. I love books. Um, whenever I have friends over, we're always talking about what are you reading right now? I know Anne is used to me asking this question to her. I'm always saying, what are you reading? What are you reading? And I, I just have tons of books, but I'm always looking for the next great read or perhaps a favorite that um, I haven't read. And so we thought we'd do kind of a round robin and maybe start with each of you giving us a suggestion of um, a favorite book or one you think everybody should read. So, Anne, do you have one to start? Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> my fav- one of my favorite books, or at least a book that has had a really big impact on me as a dog person, ah. is called Merle's Door, Lessons from a Free-Thinking Dog, oh. and by Ted Kirasote. And it's set, it's actually, Merle really existed. He's a real dog. And um, it starts when he finds... Merle as a stray dog on a river trip and adopts him and Merle goes on to teach Ted that he has a social life so I always like like you probably we are the social directors of our dogs we decide when they eat sleep walk and um, he lives the author lives in Teton Village okay in a national park and the dogs there just roam free uh-huh. and they have dog doors that's Merle's door uh-huh. and they ju- they're just like teenagers one day they just go hang out with the dog next door and then they decide to go for a swim in the river it's amazing and is it told from the dog's perspective or no it's from the person's perspective and how he's learning from Merle wow you know. about how to be social yeah how to be a dog wow yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, we were talking with Julie Castle, the CEO of Best Friends, and she was relaying some stories of how people always say, oh, you know, I got this dog and and it taught me this and it saved my life. It taught me. So, but this, this is kind of unique. It's teaching you about like social behaviors. So does he learn sort of how to hang out with others? I think he learns how to give his dog more free reign because they are people too in a way yeah so after reading this book i now have dog uh, i've had a dog door ever since oh really yep so and they you can don't at worry least, about them bringing I mean, stuff they, in or no i don't and they i mean they're contained in the yard but yeah. they can at least decide do they want to lie in the sun or do they not you know do they want to stay inside or outside they can do whatever they want and how did you find out about this book that I don't remember. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to think about that one. That's okay. Well, tell us the title and author one more time. And so, we'll, we'll make a list of these and put them on the website. It's Merle's Door, Lessons from a Free-Thinking Dog by Ted Kirasote. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Christy, you have a recommendation. Uh, yeah, so uh, one that I'd really like to recommend uh, because it's one that was uh, personally very important to me. Um, and also, I, th- I think it's just a good example of a piece of science fiction for people who never read science fiction. Cool. Um, is Light by M. John Harrison. Okay. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a really unusual book to try and describe. But basically, it involves three different timelines um, and the present day and then in the near future and then in the far future and it follows three different characters um, and and the way that their narratives kind of intersect uh, okay. throughout. Um, and it's one of those books that the narrative kind of takes a backseat to the experience of reading it um, in terms of like the prose and just the imagination of it. Uh huh. Um, and also it, it's important to know that the the author of it, M. John Harrison, kind of comes from a background of, of the British New Wave science fiction from the 60s, which oh. was very informed by um, kind of the anti-establishment politics of the time, um, uh, very much into uh, the social sciences over the hard sciences okay. and, and using kind of poetic prose and stuff. So it's it's definitely kind of like uh, uh, evolved from that yeah. um, subgenre. Okay, and w- and so the the act of reading it kind of compels you and sucks you in right away. Yeah, yeah, and and that's what's really great about Harrison's style is he um, he's actually written all over the place. Uh, he even wrote a really great um, nature book called Climbers, just about uh, mountain climbing in the UK, um, especially in the Peak District. And so he was actually really renowned for that. So so the science fiction element, uh, he kind of takes it and. 
and makes it very surreal and, and sensory and um, kind of experiential, which is which is not common for a lot yeah, of science right, fiction. Right. Yeah, right, right. And would you say that it's kind of one, if, ever, if anybody's listening and sort of wanted to get into science fiction, it's kind of a good one for that? Or is it more for the, the diehard science fiction guru? I, th- I think it's a I think it's a good entry point for for uh, people who aren't necessarily drawn to science fiction itself. Just because the characterization is so good, the prose is just uh, really sharp and and really interesting, um, and the things he. Uh, the things he does with narratives, especially in making it nonlinear, um, are just really fascinating. So if you're somebody who like likes like a David Mitchell, okay, um, then you'd be really drawn to it. Okay, awesome. And do you remember how you found out about it? I. That's a good question, and I have no idea. That's right. No I idea. mean, I'm always just curious. How, I, I don't remember how. I mean, I have so many books, which also begs the question I want to ask you guys at some point is is uh, hard copy books or Kindle readers, e-readers? You know, it's sort of this co- really contra- you know, contentious, yeah. I guess, yeah. a little bit, you know. But we'll get a few more uh, recommendations in. Okay, Mr. Nickerson, what yes. recommendation do you have for us? Well, when I first got your invitation to talk about – what book should people read? I maybe went a little different direction. And even after talking to my colleagues, I was like, well, I'm, I've always been different anyway, so I'll just stick with my different interpretation of your I love invitation. It. That's great. So if I'm thinking, I'm, instead, of, instead of asking the question, what is the latest book that people should read? Yeah. I'm thinking about, um, instead of the latest, perhaps the, the oldest. Yeah, I love and it. So I'm a, I'm a humanities teacher here at Southern Utah <laughs> University. And to, I believe to fully understand all the great books that are coming out now, we have to have a better, we, we can be benefited by having a better understanding of great books or wonderful fiction or great creativity that was written way in the past. And yeah. so instead of starting with the latest, let's go back to the very first work of fiction or mythology. So I want to suggest to people to go back and read The Odyssey by Homer. All right. You know, another great artist that had just one name. You know, <laughs> you know it wasn't started by Madonna, let's face yeah. it. <laughs> Well, the Odyssey is just, tell me why you think that. Because I, I agree and I love it. I'm glad that we have such a variety. That's exactly what I was hoping for this conversation. I mean, so if you, if you took a criticism of a modern novel or, or a modern thinker, and then you look at their bibliography or their schooling or their education or who they modeled their work after, and then you took that previous generation and modeled what did they model their work after, and you kept going back, if you're talking about Western culture, and we can talk about the new global culture, which we should be more focused on in the 21st century, there's a lot more out there than the West, and we could talk about that. But as long as we are here, and I'm a Western European white man, and I suffer <laughs> for the, from all that biases, I think it helps us to know where did the biases and the interest and the love and the creativity of Western white men come from? If you trace it all the way back, it's going to stop at Homer. Okay. Well, I want to ask, what about people out there who or might begin be— begin at Homer. Sorry. Again, that's good. Yeah. I want to ask, what about people who are a little bit intimidated or afraid? How? What do you say to that? Like, exactly. what if people feel that they can't understand it? Well, this is what they sh- got to remember is that it was written a long, long time ago. And it was it's probably uh, the product of oral tradition. But the oldest copies are written in Greek. So if our readers out there in Radio Land don't read Greek, they should remember they're going to be reading it in a modern translation of whatever language. It's been translated into virtually every modern language. So we, as you're looking for a translation or you're looking to read Homer, test them out and find a translation that speaks to you. Ah. I think every translator has that job of trying to capture the original work and the original ideas in the modern language to which they're translating. And as long as we're talking about librarians, we recognize that a translator's work, her work is just as as important as the original author. And when we are creating bibliographic records, the translator is a primary author just as much as the first author who wrote the original work. So we recognize, as you mentioned, the translator is super important. So if you think, I'll never understand Homer or the ancient Greeks, you will. Find a translator who, who translated into your first language now, test a few out, and it's immediately accessible. That's why Homer is a great work. Okay. It's immediately accessible to you as it was to the people who read it in 600 BC. Timeless. I love it. Okay. Well, that's our first round. We did it. Yay. Good job. (laughs) So I've got a song and um, I stumbled across, I don't even know how I stumbled across this album, but me and my obsession for world music and um, currently people who know me well know I'm completely obsessed with Irish music, Irish drumming, particularly the Bowron, um, which is a drum I'm really excited about um, and planning a a trip around and all of that. Um, But I have a song here 
here. It's called Nemesis, and the artist is Catherine Tickle, um, which is T-I-C-K-E-L-L. Uh, check it out and see what you think. You're listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. everyone welcome back that was Catherine Tickle officially Catherine Tickle and the darkening uh, and that album is called hollow bone if you want to check it out it's really cool it's just a bunch of kind of modern takes on some Irish music and I really like it this is Lynn Vartan you're listening to the apex hour and we are talking about books today um, but I also want to mention a little bit about the podcast if you're listening to this you're probably listening to it from a podcast and we would like to encourage 
encourage a call to action from everyone to download as many episodes as possible. Um, that's one of the way w- that we are tracking the success of the podcast uh, here through web services at SDU. And we would love to encourage everyone to support it by, of course, leaving a rating, but also please download the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so we can keep our great radio show going. So welcome back to my librarian friends. And I'd love to start by uh, kind of picking up the thread of conversation that we had going during the the break, which is um, how wonderful it is to share books with others uh, when you're maybe reading in a group uh, and sharing in a group and talking about opinions and all that. And um, I think there's a lot of great book groups going on. And I'd love to hear some of your opinions and about book groups, about book groups, and also about which book groups maybe people can find if they're looking for. So Chris, do you want to maybe tell us a little bit? Yeah, I, I think I'd like to uh, plug the, the the SUU book club actually, which is a, a student run club that I that I supervise for the students, and and they completely self select uh, the titles they read each semester. Uh, last semester, they um, basically did a theme of adaptations where they would read the book, um, and then we set it up to where they could watch the movie in our classroom in the evenings. Awesome. Um, and so they did like hidden figures and cool. um, a few others. Yeah. So, uh, so that was a lot of fun. And if you're interested in being a part of that, you can just email me at Christopher Clark one at su.edu. And then I can get you um, uh, organized with that group and on the same page. And then is that, that's mostly a student group. Yeah, that's a student group. Okay. Um, so students out there, this one's for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and outside of that, I actually do a lot of, uh, book group stuff just on Goodreads with some, so there are some fellow, fellow faculty members that, um, that I'm in communication with on Goodreads. Oh. Um, one of our librarians, Rosie, is on there and Jess Tavorty, and we always kind of swap. Um, you know, book suggestions and, and ratings and that sort Maybe of thing. Maybe you should tell the audience what Goodreads is in case people out there don't know what it is. Oh, yeah. So so Goodreads is basically a an online public forum where you can go and, and read and rate books. Um, yeah. And it serves uh, a couple of really good uses. One, you connect with a lot of good recommendations and book people. And then two, uh, it also helps a lot of up and coming authors um, get reviews and ratings out yeah. there um, to, to help their works get noticed. So. And you can have shelves mm-hmm. of things you want to yeah. read and keep lists and all different kinds of stuff. Oh, and it's so fascinating because the, the groups that kind of find each other, uh, they can have this, the oddest subgenres. Like you can find a whole list of like, um, like <laughs> I- Iraqi cyberpunk books, you know, Whoa. if you're into that. You know? <laughs> That's amazing. But, yeah. <laughs> How cool. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there uh, other opinions about book groups or other book clubs that we should know about? Matt, do you, mean, you, you asked the question of how can a, how can someone get involved in a book group? So one way is, as Chris was saying, word of mouth, talk to your friends. But another great way to get involved in a book group is to start a book group. Ah. And in our family, my wife and I have both are we're both involved in book groups. She started a book group when we first moved to Cedar City thirty years ago, and it's still going today. It, hers is a ladies' book group. Women of all ages get together and they read a book every month, and they come to someone's house and they talk about it. And their book club is called Books in the Hood. I it, love it. It originally started as just our neighbors, but now it expands to uh, even outside of Cedar City. Some people from St. George drive up. No and, kidding. And to it. How and often do they read? One a, Once a month, I believe. Okay. And in the couples book group that we belong to together, we read a book every two months. Ah. And that book group, we what I like about groups, you ask this, because the couples are quite diverse that belong to our group, and we think that's important for our group so that we, the advantage to me is then I have to read the book before I go to the meeting, and I'll be <laughs> embarrassed as the, right, the library director doesn't read the book. Right. And, and, and I don't like the books that they read necessarily, yeah. but I'm forced to read books that are outside of my regular genre, outside of my comfort zone, and lo and behold, sometimes I actually like a book that I thought I was going to hate. Yeah. So book groups are good to open our minds to, to new ideas. And a couples group. I don't know why that didn't that hadn't crossed my mind. You know, I've I've, I've thought of book group. I've been in book groups. I've thought of book clubs a lot, but I never really thought of a couples book club. Yeah, because cool. it's 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 um you get double your money because mm-hmm. as you're reading it with your partner, then you're you have a miniature group of only two groups, right. and then you talk about it, and then you can fight or argue or agree. Then when you get there, she can say something. Well, Matt said I don't agree with. He told me this, but when I read it. And then you get both all the couples going. It's pretty awesome. Cool. And our, our book group also has a dinner every night when we, as we meet. Uh-huh. And over the years, the, the dinner has become almost as important as the reading. Oh, and yeah. so the, the current name of our club is You Don't Even Have to Read the Book Club. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm not sure that really counts then. I don't know. <laughs> but we all still read it. But the food is, the food is important. And books yeah. bring people together like food bring people together. I think that's cool. That's the beautiful part of it. I 100% agree with you there. Well, let's get to some more recommendations. So, Anne, can we start with you again? Yeah. So um, I was just thinking... Um, what my first book was that I really that got me into reading oh and that was uh, when I couldn't even read yet and we were reading this our teacher would read this book to us it's a Dutch children's book but it's translated yeah. into English and in English it is called Tow Truck Pluck oh. <laughs> and um, it's about this little guy and he doesn't seem to have any parents but he has a to- red tow truck oh. and he solves all these kind of environmental problems how so, cute is that? It's, it's a really great book, and um, in but is it a is it a young a kids book? Kids book, kids yeah, book. For sure. It's um, in the canon of the Netherlands, so it's considered a very important book to our culture. Wow! Yeah, and once again, the title and author? It's pluck. Oh, um, tow truck pluck by the Dutch writer Annie M. G. Schmidt. Oh my gosh, that's great. It's from 1971. And our teacher would have a, she would open all the windows and she'd created a song about the book and we'd sing the song so all our mothers who were at home would hear that we were going to read Oh. That book, and we she would read it to us, yeah, and it and that was kind of my first book group, right? All my oh. in my class. What a great story! And I'm sure we have some families and parents listening who are maybe looking for something to read and, and to their children. And this sounds like a great suggestion. Thank you so much. All right, Chris, we're up for your next one. Uh, yeah, so I think the next recommendation I'll make is is actually for a comic book. Okay. So I'm I'm a very passionate advocate for comic books uh-huh. as literature. Um, and so like if you know that like the history of the novel and how it emerged is a very middle class form and it was kind of sneered at for a while. Okay. Um, uh, you know, especially in the, in the time you know up until Austin when it kind of became a little more uh, legitimized. Right. Um, so, like, pulp uh, pulp fiction and comic books became kind of, like, the de facto working class genre. And so, like, growing up in my household, we had a lot of comic books around. Um, and one that I would recommend that is available in omnibus form is the Doom Patrol omnibus, and it's by Grant Morrison, who is a British comic book writer. Um, and it is just a just fabulous, mind-blowing piece of work. It's at, like, 1,200 pages of, wow. um, you know, in the in the omnibus form. And it's it just follows a group of... Uh, kind of surrealist superheroes as oh my they, gosh. yeah as they kind of um uh face like different threats to reality and it and it's super interesting because Morrison brought in a lot of his background in in the punk scene from uh-huh. the 80s um and also uh just his his own kind of like weird esoteric background in the circles he ran in and so it becomes um like this very interesting work of art even as it also operates as a as a really fun text okay. and does just a lot of like interesting interesting things um in kind of marrying the two now you mentioned an omnibus form i'm not sure yeah. i know what that oh, is no that's a great question because that's another thing that's really interesting about the comic book genre is that it's uh, they basically publish issue by issue okay and, right and over time they'll collect the the issues into um omnibus you know, a, an omnibus of one kind like or another. Like a volume or yeah, a collection. Yeah, and, and, and this kind of represents his run with uh, with that comic book, but there have been other writers before and since. Um, and so it, it, so it represents like a piece of a greater narrative that is also an enclosed narrative in itself. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting in that sense because then other writers subsequently can uh, go in and put their own spin on things and their own interpretations. So it's actually a, like an incredibly collaborative format, ah, cool. which is also um, really cool about and it. And when you purchase it, would you be purchasing that whole amount, the 1,200 pages all at once? Uh, that would I, that would be my recommendation, <laughs> okay. if, if you can. But you can also get them in, in slimmer volumes that are kind of like um, – uh, it's broken down into um, arcs you okay. know, that you can – purchase individually okay and again the title and uh, yeah it's the doom patrol omnibus and the writer doom is grant patrol. Morrison. okay mm-hmm. got it and the author one more time uh, grant morrison grant morrison okay mm-hmm. great and the art set, I'm, I'm sure is amazing and it sounds mm-hmm. like it's a great combination of text and and graphic beauty yeah it's 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 the best book i've ever read about a painting that eats paris so 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. Just like you sold me on that. <laughs> That's great. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you for that recommendation. Okay. And finishing off our next trio of recommendations. Wow. Where are you going next? I think I'll just build on what my colleagues have already been saying, but stick w- with, with my story, which is old p- art from previous decades or centuries that are still fun to read and still contributing to the overall conversation that is the literature of the West. Love it. Um, and sticking with a translation again, um, it would be Don Quixote de la Mancha, who is w- written by Cervantes. Yes. And so it's important to me also because it's one of the first great works of Western literature that was not written in Greek or Latin. Right. So as as the Roman Empire died and the Romance languages and the barbarian languages from the north started coming into their own and, and the Rome broke up into smaller and smaller pieces, artists began to write literature in these new languages that were formed as, as the Roman Empire broke up. And uh, Dante would be one of them. We won't go there today. We'll go with Cervantes, who wrote this in, in the old Spanish language. And it's obviously been translated. So again, readers, you have to, you can play with several translations if you're going to read it in English. If you are a bilingual or a Spanish person, and there's probably many of them in our audience that speak Spanish, try reading it in Spanish too. It's amazing. And I'd also like to talk about adaptations. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, but you've seen the Broadway musical, The Man of La Mancha, that's taking a few of the little stories that happen to, to the hero of the book. Right. And they've made it into a Broadway musical, which is hugely, hugely famous. And maybe that's a way you could take your first steps that would invite you into a great work of Western literature. And is there something particularly about this story that you love? (laughs) Uh, I I like it for lots of reasons, but I think, again, I'm just going into that great arc. If you go Uh. back to my original book, which was Homer, it's a book about a a man. And and sorry, everyone, because this is, again, the ancient (laughs) patriarchal world we all grew up in. Uh, But you can, he mentioned Jane Austen, and they did allow women to break out and finally contribute. And that was, it was sad that we missed them for so long. But this is another story about another European man. But Odysseus, in in the first book I talked about, went on these adventures. And it's a, a story of the history of his adventures and what we can learn about the human experience. And that's what that's what Don Quixote is doing. It's the it's his many little adventures, and maybe that's one reason why I find them pretty accessible because you can break the story up, yeah. you know, and you can put it down and come back. And every time you come back, there's another small story. You're not in this big Tolstoy esque book, right? Right. And cool. so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Don Quixote de la Mancha. I love it. Okay. Well, I've got one also. Um, people are always asking me about music, um, since that's kind of one of my little areas of expertise and what I teach here at the university, and um, I've been really enjoying and, and recommending a book called Year of Wonder. The author is Clemency Burton Hill. And basically what it is, is it's almost like a diary of a year. And um, so each page is a day. And it talks about a great work of music. Uh, and it encourages you to listen to that work on that day and gives you a couple little tidbits. But it's kind of like your daily guide to classical music. And it's some of his very, very famous uh, pieces. Some of them are not very famous pieces, but it's kind of a nice, again, you can dip in, dip out and and check in and go like, yeah, oh, this is recommending a specific um, Chopin piano piece. Okay, let me listen to that today. And it's sort of a nice little touch sound. So that's my recommendation for the moment. It's Year of Wonder, uh, Clemency Burton Hill. But now I've got some more music to play for you. Um, I played this band uh, on a live radio show. We actually didn't make a podcast of it uh, at the beginning of the semester, and I'm so excited about this band. Somebody in Australia recommended it to me, and it's a band called The Cat Empire, an Australian band that mixes all kinds of influences. And this song is called Hello. So check it out, Cat Empire. Some thoughts in my head that were making me feel high On oh, my head was a hoodie and my ears was some bass I was walking by my dog when I saw the sexy face come towards me With a little cheeky smile if she was a phone I pick her up and dial the fire brigade Oh zero 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 she stole me my tracks I said I'm oh, hello hello oh, hello hello Sleeping in a sand with some dreams 
in my head that will cause an extension to the tail of my bed and the waves were rolling like the curves on the lakes like a sweet beach pillow with a center false spread in the midst of the summer heard some footsteps are creeping and I woke to discover the woman I've been dreaming she knelt down beside said can I share your pillow I rolled over and I said well hello hello Some like cars and some like the houses with the rooftop spires And some like to gossip about some rich sugar daddies But me and my friends will like the golden brown honeys And some like watching people living on TV That's a little strange if you're asking me Cause I like to eat and laugh and f***ing play down All these other things I know Well, hello, hello <laughs> Hello, hello. I love how the end of that song is. That song is called Hello. The band is the Cat Empire. They're an Australian band that I just think is so fun. Oh my gosh, if you need to pick me up, put that song on. Um, we are here today on the Apex Hour. You're listening to KSU Youth under 91.1. And we are talking about books and reading. Um, so we'd like to do a little bit of some plugs for some events coming up. Um, we know we were talking about the book event on Monday at 1 p.m. at the library where you can come and get recommendations and some bookmarks and some root beer. But there's some other events coming up too. Chris, tell us what else we can find out. Yeah, so um, on Tuesday, which will be uh, October 15th at 7 p.m., uh, on the second floor of the library uh, in the Huntsman Reading Room, we will have uh, what's called the Future Poetry. And this will be a discussion between um, Lee Modisett, who is a, a local best-selling yeah. um, He's a science fiction and fantasy writer. Mm -hmm. um, he'll be uh, in discussion with uh, Danielle Dabrowski, who who writes and, and teaches poetry mm -hmm. here on campus. Um, and she will be talking about um, it, everything that kind of falls under that theme. So exper experimental forms, um, you know, what what qualifies as poetry and the many different, like, um, ways it can manifest. Oh, um, cool. And she'll be doing uh, some reading from her work and there'll be Q&A. So uh, if you're a poet or you just love poetry or you're, or you're fascinated by it, then then it's definitely worth checking out. Awesome. Or if you don't understand it. Yeah. Oh, and know, for, it's for not just for people who love it. That's why we're doing it at the library at a university. Yeah. And for students out there, I always like to plug that these events do have free food. So please, like, <laughs> come get some food and then and then also um, edify yourselves while you're there. Awesome. So that's at uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday at 7 o'clock on the second floor of the library. Awesome. Thanks for that. Well, I also wanted to ask my question about, um, and it's more just playful than anything else. Uh, I keep 
I think I'm asking because personally I'm having this existential struggle about e-readers versus books in hand. I really love books in hand, but then I travel a lot and, you know, with the e-reader I can just have tons. So I was just kind of curious. Um, I know it can be a feisty topic at times, but <laughs> what do you guys think? Uh, actual books or e-readers? What are your opinions? Real books, baby. <laughs> all the way. Real books, baby. I love it. But so you all feel pretty strong 100% about that. No, I don't. Oh, well. But, I, and I, but I'm old. <laughs> um, but, and I own thousands. I, my personal library holds thousands and thousands of books. Yeah. Uh, but so you I, like e-readers. I do like e-readers. I, when I purchase a book now, I make a conscious decision of which way I'm going to go ah. in, in many cases. And there have been a, and I'm usually right. A, a book in hand is one that I want to return to again, yeah. one that I might want to make notes in, um, one that um, I want to take – with me and hold. Um, if it's a quick read and it's more about the plot and more about entertainment, sometimes I'll get it on an e-reader. There have been a few e-reader books that after I got started in them, I went, whoa, I better go buy the ah, quote okay. unquote real thing. But like you said, traveling, I'm a, I'm a person who used to travel for work or for pleasure and my carry-on would have five books in it. Yeah. And now if I can have a Kindle and have 500 books, uh, that's a big, strong selling point for me. I know. That's it. Exactly. You guys are both book, hardcore book? Y yeah. So so I do come out on the side of, of like, hardcover, like, you know, like, holding it, print copy whenever you can. Um, but there but there are um, some positives to the ebook format. And one of those is, especially for, for older readers, you can, um, you know, you can modify the font, you know, right, right there so you don't have to pay an additional surcharge for a large print book if yeah. they even have it available. Um, and also it, it tends to be, you know, more eco-friendly, right? Right. Um, but I think the main concern, especially with ebooks, is that you, you never really own it in the same sense that you own yeah. A, a print book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's licensed to you. And, um, and there are, there's a whole subset of issues in the library world related to that and, yeah. and access. So. Well, I think we might want to talk about that just a little bit. Yeah. Because in the library collection, we hold tens of thousands of ebooks also oh. as part of our library collection. And students, we think, oh, the students of the 21st century are going to flock to the ebooks. Right. They don't. Oh. Generally speaking, they, we'll show them at, at the questions desk all these books. Oh, that's an ebook, and they'll, they'll want to jump to a paper book, which is yeah. very surprising. Interesting. So another advantage to students or researchers out there of an ebook is it ha it, when you open it as an, as an electronic file on your tablet or on your computer or your phone, you can search by a word. Yeah. Try doing that in your 1,200-page paper book right. and just trying to find where do they talk about whatever your topic is. Cool. As a research tool, electronic books can be super powerful. Yeah, interesting. And so we, I just wanted to give a shout-out to people who are doing research or students who are, or anybody in the in the community can use the SU Library. And if you run to an ebook, give it a try and, and try to learn what the plus sides of it and if you already think you know the negative sides. Well, I love asking about this topic. I just think it's kind of interesting, everybody's different takes and all that. But let's get to some more recommendations. So, Anne, we're going to come back to you. I'm right. always starting with you. Hope that's There's okay. one thing, though, um, that I do use electronically, and those are the audiobooks. Oh, you like audiobooks. I do, yeah, because you can kind of read as you're doing your dishes or walking your dog or whatever it might nice. be. Nice. So I do listen to a lot of audiobooks. Okay. And if you go to the public library, um, you can get a free library card and download the Libby app, and you right. can download a lot of audiobooks and actually ebooks too. Okay, cool. I have to put a plug in for audiobooks again. Okay. Sorry, Lynn. Let's hear it. I know Let's we gotta hear it. move on. When you're but not again, listening to my podcast, of course. You know. <laughs> and you can also listen to the podcast on the same listening device that we yes. listen to ebooks on. But so you like audiobooks so also. I, I listen to ebooks when I'm working out also. And again, it's that quality and do I want to hold on to it and do I want to own it? Yeah. Right. right. Or just license it. So there's been a case when I've been listening to an ebook and go, no, gotta have the real thing. I like it. So, okay. Cool. Yeah. All right, Anne, what's your next recommendation? All right. So um, Matt just mentioned the human experience of the white male anyway. <laughs> so one of that, my human. favorite authors, um, so in general, is Anne Patchett. Oh, yeah. And mm. she has a whole series of fabulous books. I just think she really understands the human experience and what it means to be us. And um, she's also very cool because she was really worried that the independent bookstores were going away. Uh huh. And, you know, so the, you have the big Barnes and Noble, the big stores, and all the local bookstores were just going away, and people just order on Amazon. 
So she started her own bookstore in Nashville, huh. Tennessee, and I've been to it, and it's fantastic. Wow. Another nice feature, there's dogs in the store, like her dogs in the store and uh, other people who work there. All the dogs are just wandering around. <laughs> I love it. But, yeah, it's a great bookstore and with a, with a fantastic selection because that's nice about the independent bookstores. They don't just have the big commercial titles. Right. They have stuff that's good and interesting to read as well. I didn't know that about her at all. She's fascinating. Cool. Yep. And she just has a new book out. Uh, it's called The Dutch House. And it's nothing to do with Holland. Just, just <laughs> I know I was going to say. Just <laughs> okay. And I haven't read that one yet, but I read um, her, the previous one, Commonwealth. Fantastic. Okay. And, and what's Commonwealth about? It's about these two families that are merging because their parents are divorced okay. and get together yeah. and all the problems Wow. The relationship problems and the sibling issues, fascinating. Okay. And then from a music perspective, her book, Bel Canto. Oh, yes. That's yeah, great. It's a really fantastic yeah. one, too. Okay. And Pachet in Bel Canto and Commonwealth are two recommendations. Thank you for those. All right, Chris, your next recommendation. Uh, so I think the next one I'll recommend is actually um, – uh, a book of short stories, because okay. I think um, short stories are another form I'm really passionate about, and yeah. I, I would like to see people uh, reading more of it. Uh, and this is a, a recent, uh, a, a recently translated collection. Uh, the author is Mariana Enriquez, and uh, the collection in English is called uh, Things We Lost in the Fire. Ooh. Um, and it's it's actually a really great October reading, because it features a lot of ghost stories and a lot of kind of like ghoulish, shiver-inducing um, stories. Um but also what makes it interesting is she's very much writing from the perspective of, of um, being a lower class woman growing up in, in Argentina. So it's very much informed by uh, South American politics uh, from, you know, the 70s up to the present day. Oh, and, yeah. um, and and it's it's really fascinating. Sometimes it's very harrowing, oh. but it's also kind of blended with the fantastical, right? Because she's also writing in the tradition of like Borges and, and Marquez and, oh, I and some love of these magical it. realists. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's a really great book. Oh, that's, this recommend. sounds great. Yeah, and remind me the title and author again. Uh, Things We Lost in the Fire, uh, Mariana Enriquez. Okay, and she's Argentinian. <laughs> oh, that sounds exciting. Cool, thanks for that one. All right, back to you. Wow. I think I will just quickly re recommend for reading one of the f great works of Western literature, the, one of the first great works in Western literature in English, so you won't have to read it in translation if you are an, an English speaker. And if you're not an English speaker, I will just have to apologize because I still, I still believe translations, no matter how good they are, and translators are amazing in the work they do, it's very difficult and I would say impossible to truly bring the spirit and the, the soul of an of a artistic work it, through, through the translation process. And it would be Milton's Paradise Lost. Which is, which if you want to start with the with a work that's written in English that's had a huge impact not only in Western literature, Western philosophy, but actually to the world, try Paradise Lost. Of the three I've mentioned, it might be the hardest to to get into, but yeah. I'm still going to recommend it okay. just for that case that if especially if you're an English speaker uh, and you're part of the Western tradition, I think you owe it to yourself to at least give it a try and, yeah. and try to find out of a great work written in the native language. If you can't do that, then you can move on to Shakespeare and then that'll do you for it. <laughs> okay. I've never read that. I've never read it actually. I think I absolutely should probably dig or in give there. it a try, Lynn. Yeah, I know. I, I will. I'm inspired. Yeah. You haven't read it either? Nope. Okay. Well, it's, it's, we, now it's we know. It's very much allegory and, and Christian and so it, ah. it's, it's a little so different. So we know what our next read, maybe Anne, we should start a book club and, and begin with that I'm you, think, you think it'll be popular <laughs> let's see <laughs> all right uh, well i uh, along the short stories i have a, a recommendation that actually one of our past guests uh recommended to me and um it is a, a, a group of stories uh the title is called americana and the author is hampton sides who's just a fantastic author and you know it it really just kind of uh, took me because it's an incredible stories written so so well 
all about uh, random small moments in Americana. So it starts out with the tour story of a skateboarding empire. And then it talks about this uh, uh, sort of island community where men go for holiday and it's super private and super elite and about sort of breaking into that. Uh, and then there's, there's some stories that have to do with Utah. There's just all different kinds and they're really interesting topics and uh, really interesting stories and that's Americana by Hampton side so that's my recommendation I we are almost out of time but what I'd love to do is go around maybe one more time really quickly and do one more either a, a, a book that you have read or maybe one that's up next for you as well one that you're excited okay Matt just like oh. it seems so excited so let's start with you no it's a weird I'm weirdly excited about this because I've just been going on and on about the value of understanding the the evolution of thought and literature in western culture but I've recognized in myself a huge lacuna a huge bias. And so I've started reading one of the great works of literature of China. And oh. it's called, it's called um, The Dream of the Red Chamber. The Dream of the, the Red, Red Chamber. Chamber. And it's already, it's already amazing and captivating. But even through translation, I already feel that constant um, discombobulation that this is not Western. Is and it it's a, awesome? Is it a modern work or is it's it one a, of the eighteenth century? Okay, so cl- cl- so more it's not classic. ancient, ancient. But I'll, I'll move back. I thought I I wanted to read something. It's it's considered one of the four great Chinese okay. works of literature, and I didn't want to go too ancient for my first little dabble. Okay, eighteenth century. The my translation is called "The Dream of the Red Chamber." Okay, I love it. You sound so excited about it that I have I, to go check it out just based on that alone. And, I don't, and I'm only, I haven't got far enough into it, but enough to know it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Okay, perfect. Well, back to you. We'll go, we'll go reverse direction. So Chris, either another recommendation or one that you're excited about getting to in the coming weeks. Oh gosh, there, uh, there's something on the TBR pile. I'm not sure where to go, um, <laughs> but I, I think I, I would like to recommend uh, Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, just because it's one of those like difficult, daunting books that I try and recommend to as many people as possible. Okay. Um, with the caveat that the first time I read it, I got about halfway through, and I've never come so close to throwing a book against a wall. I was so frustrated. Really. And then a few weeks passed, and I couldn't get it out of my head, so I just decided to pick it back up again, and. I read it in a couple of days, loved it, and would just, I think it's brilliant. It is. Well, okay, so this is not a story that I know. Gravity's Rainbow. Can you tell me a little yes. more? So, Gravity's Rainbow is, is probably Pynchon's best known work. He wrote it in 1972 or three, I'm trying to remember, and it won the National Book Award. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, kind of following the same style as Moby Dick, and he he has established theme, and he has written like 800 pages uh, of variations on that theme, uh, following the madcap adventures of, of of this private in the army named Tyrone Slothrop. Um, and it slips in between so many different genres. Like it starts out as a comedy, then it becomes like a war drama, and then it becomes a science fiction story, and then it just becomes a whole slew of bizarre. Other things, including religious allegory, fable. But um, what made you so frustrated with it the first time around? Well, and and this is an experience that I think uh, a lot of people might experience is, is um, that sometimes a story doesn't do the thing you expect it to do um. and doesn't follow the narrative like rhythms that you expect it to follow. And that can be frustrating because we, we expect it to do a certain thing and it doesn't. Um, right. But if you stick with it, sometimes it can be immensely rewarding. And yeah, cool. very good. All right. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to check it out. All right. And you're going to close us out here. All right. So in my, I'm in a book group too. <laughs> and it has a lot of faculty members on it and retired faculty members from oh. SUU. And the next thing we're going to read is, so I haven't read this at all, okay? It's called This Land, How Cowboys, Capitalism, and Corruption Are Ruining the American West. Whoa. That's intense. By Christopher Ketchum. Okay. And this, so in my book club, we take turns recommending books. So this book was recommended by Dr. Kelly Goonan from Outdoor Recreation. Oh, yay, Kelly. I know her well. And so is it is it fiction? Is it near, nonfiction? A journalist? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Nonfiction. Well, you're going to have to report back to us on that one. <laughs> this land. And the author again is? Is Christopher Ketchum. Okay. Awesome. And I interlibrary loaned it, so our library doesn't have it. I, mine is from the Davis County Library, but... <laughs> 
Christopher, who's sitting next to me and orders for English, thinks he may order us a copy. Yeah, I actually did see that that title come up, and it sounded really interesting. So okay, great. Well, I just want to take a moment and say thank you guys so much for being here and sharing all of these great recommendations. I love it. I've gotten a whole bunch of new titles to put on my list, and uh, again, we want to make sure to remember the great events that are happening on campus next Monday, one p.m. at the library. Next Tuesday at seven seven. 7.30, 7, 7. 7. Um, and just to take advantage of uh, a reading and, and maybe we'll have you back and talk about uh, how to make reading more a part of our life because I know we that was something we even wanted to get to and didn't get to. But uh, for now, everybody find a book, get reading, read for fun, um, broaden your mind, broaden your horizons. And with that, we will say goodbye from the Apex Hour and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.